ولقد سبقت كلمتنا لعبادنا المرسلين. It is the most important story in the country. The next major war for the United States is with ISIS. But what media and politicians are not telling you the truth about, where ISIS came from, who created them, and why before one more dollar is spent, one more American life lost, you need to know the truth. The first step toward truth is to be informed. The name ISIS is one that every American knows by now. The biggest threat to our national security since Al Qaeda, right? They are a brutal, savage group known for public beheadings and mass executions. They are the face of the new war on terror. Right now, the U.S. military is conducting airstrikes in Syria in a supposed attempt to take out ISIS targets. Meanwhile, the White House and military leaders are talking about possible boots on the ground in Iraq again. Only three years after the war in Iraq was declared over. In fact, this war, according to former Defense Secretary Leon Panetta, could last for decades. I think we're looking at uh, you know, kind of a 30-year war uh, kind of uh, history here. So who exactly is ISIS, and where did they come from? It's entirely a creation of the United States' behavior in Iraq. That's how we got to where we are, because of war, because of occupation, because of torture. For answers, we traveled to Los Angeles to meet with Angela Keaton, the founder of Antiwar.com. We destabilized and wrecked Iraq. I mean, it, it caused it to, to fail miserably, and that's entirely the responsibility of the United States government. There's no one else at fault there. I mean, as horrible as Saddam Hussein was, there was, you know, Iraq was not unstable. It was a functioning country as much as those sorts of things go, and it was not a particularly horrible hellhole if you were a religious minority. To understand where ISIS comes from, you have to understand two storylines. The first is what Keaton just said. When the U.S. first went into Iraq, we blew the country apart. We destroyed the government, toppled Saddam Hussein, destroyed infrastructure, and most importantly, left behind a power vacuum. One that would have never have existed had Hussein not been overthrown by the U.S. government. Daniel McAdams with the Ron Paul Institute says this is an historical fact that media just won't discuss. All of this has to do with U.S. action in the region, which destroyed the infrastructure, which destroyed Iraqi society, which destroyed the government. Uh, you had a lot of people who lived under Saddam Hussein, uh, who may not have been as, as happy as Lark's. Nevertheless, they were living somewhat normal lives. The U.S. put a government in power in Baghdad uh, that all of a sudden was, was their enemies, that treated them very, very badly. Now that is the easy part of the story. The U.S. created conditions in Iraq where ISIS could get its start. But here's the other storyline that you have to understand, that even with Saddam gone, ISIS still couldn't have risen to power had it not been for what happened next. ISIS actually began as a small insurgent group in Iraq in 2006. They had no money, no real ability to recruit, but they did work to create very limited problems for the U.S. military. It wasn't until 2009 that ISIS shifted its focus from Iraq, where it was largely unsuccessful in developing a foothold, and focused on the civil war in Syria. Even there, ISIS struggled to gain any foothold because the two largest groups fighting against President Bashar al-Assad were al-Nusra Front, or al-Qaeda, and the Free Syrian Army. Then came a pivotal moment that most Americans aren't even aware of. In June of 2013, a northern general for the Free Syrian Army spoke out on Al Jazeera Qatar and stated that if international forces did not send weapons the rebels attempting to overthrow Syrian President Bashar al-Assad would lose their war in just one month. Well, only months before, I had personally confronted President Obama about why the U.S. was covertly funding those Syrian rebels. And yet there's some concern about the U.S. funding uh, the Syrian opposition when yeah. there are a lot of reports that al-Qaeda is yeah. kind of heading up that opposition. Yeah. How do you justify the two? Well, I, uh, I share that concern. Uh, and so uh, what we've done is to say, we will provide non-lethal assistance to Syrian opposition leadership that are committed to a political transition, committed to uh, a, uh, an observance of human rights. We're not going to just dive in and get involved with a civil war 
that in fact uh, involves some elements of people who are genuinely trying to get a better life, but also involve uh, some folks who would over the long term do uh, the United States harm. So even as the president acted as if he was being careful, politicians like Senator John McCain demanded action. So it's a totally unfair and unbalanced fight. And now the rebels are the freedom fighters. The, uh, the Syrian National Army are, uh, are being beaten every place around Syria because of the overwhelming firepower and air power is really the deciding factor. So you've got to take their air power, power out of it. You've got to have a safe zone where they can operate, train and equip. And uh, we've got to turn this thing around. So what happened? Well, within just a matter of weeks of that Syrian general making his plea for international help, the U.S., the Saudis, Jordan, Qatar, Turkey, and Israel began providing weapons and training and money to the so-called rebel Free Syrian Army. By September of 2013, American media outlets, including CNN and the Washington Post, were reporting that CIA-funded weapons had begun flowing to Syrian rebels. The weapons were not American-made, but funded and organized by the CIA. The artillery was described as light weapons, some anti-tank weapons and ammunition. But where it all fell apart, weapons that the U.S. insisted would be used by freedom fighters would be in less than one year in the hands of ISIS fighters. So where were these fighters coming from? Actually, from the Free Syrian Army, the group that John McCain insisted would help the U.S. to overthrow Assad. That same group actually giving weapons, selling weapons, and sending fighters to join with this new group called the Islamic State. It was in June of 2014 when suddenly, after being a no-name group in Syria, that ISIS emerged, heavily armed and trained by U.S. and coalition special forces, making a dramatic entrance by crossing back over the Syrian border into Iraq capturing Mosul and much of the northern part of the country. One of the most important facts that mainstream media ignores time and time again is that ISIS was able to grow so fast because of all the U.S. military equipment they were able to seize. Equipment that our military left in Iraq. Truckloads of Humvees, tanks and weaponry that instead of taking or destroying, the U.S. government simply decided to leave behind. Even when the U.S. government knew that ISIS fighters were capturing that equipment, for crying out loud, these guys were posting pictures of themselves driving and standing on U.S. military equipment, making video of themselves with it, we did nothing. Why? 